It was a dark and moonless night. Something lurked in the shadows. Wait, how can there be shadows if it's a dark, moonless night? Anyway, back to the story. Lurking in the shadows was a commercial bank. Beware the banks. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents channel. My name is Jesse Durham. We're close to that Halloween season, so today's message is going to be Beware the Banks. Let's start with how Nash would talk about coming back to banking at the you and the me level. The, the book Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash is all about how to uh, reacquire the banking function in your life and not abdicate that to the commercial banks. Let's talk about some things that are said, some scary things that are said in the financial world. Now, there are lots of things that we could start just as a lay person, maybe things that we've heard from friends and neighbors and family, things like money doesn't grow on trees. Money won't buy happiness. Money's the root of all evil. You've heard some of those sayings, and that's just the information, that's just the message that we are inundated with as people. And then on top of that, on top of the relationships that we have in our communities, in our homes, in schools, in the commercial world, we have these financial gurus that'll say things like, buy term and invest the difference, or whole life is a horrible place to put money. Some will tell you to retire and focus on retire, build up that nest egg. They'll use that term nest egg. Others on the other end of the spectrum are saying savers are losers. Most everybody out there is talking about something in the marketplace, and it's all about the rate of return or the return on your investment. It's park your money here, earn this deferment on your taxation, diversify your portfolio, and then we've got every financial company out there, including the banks, including the credit unions, with their jingles that if I started to hum them or whistle them, you would know them, and their catchy phrases. There are all these different companies out there that want us to park our money with them, buy products from them, get in the market with them and I'm not making any kind of investment advice tax advice what I'm trying to bring us back to is again focusing on the banking function who controls the banking function in your life if you're a business owner who controls the banking function for your business if you are an investor who controls the banking function of your investing it's just a valid question to ask who's controlling that banking function now I'm saying beware the commercial banks because right there, if we just look at the fact that banks are owned by someone and that the owners of banks earn anywhere from 400 to 1300 percent on the dollars that we put there, they enjoy dividends and profits. They just don't share those. That's the owners of the banks that are receiving that. I mean, oh my goodness, adding to the scariness, of course, they're lending out multiples of the dollars that we're depositing there. Nash would say it was evil. Nash would say that the banks are loaning money that doesn't exist, having us pay interest on that, and that is evil. So it's, it's a scary financial world out there, and we're just born into this particular paradigm of you go out and you work and you make all your deposits in someone else's entity, someone else's business, someone else's bank, credit union. I don't care. They're all the same. I know folks would like to argue about the minutia there, but again, who controls the banking function in your life? Whether it's a credit union or another bank that we would all recognize by name, it doesn't matter. Who owns that entity where you deposit? your funds, where you deposit your cash flows and incomes, 
Who owns that entity? Who controls that entity? Who is doing what with the capital that's there? Because let's recognize something. Let's recognize something. When we deposit money in the bank, that money is no longer ours. That money is no longer ours. Here's a real simple test to be able to see. You, If you wrote your name on a bill that you were depositing in the bank, could you come back the next day and get your bill back? Not a chance. Could you come back even within an hour and get that same bill back? Nope, they're not putting it in a box in the back saying, well, this is Jesse's money. This is Jesse's box. Nope. That money is in motion. That bank is lending out multiples of every dollar that we deposit. And when we do deposit, notice the words here. Words have meanings and they're important. When we deposit in a bank, that bank owes us that particular amount. But that money is now under the control and discretion of the bank's use. So the bank is using our money that we're depositing there. Yes, that we have a note essentially at that point, an IOU with the bank at that point because of that deposit, but the bank's using that money. And if we're just using those commercial banks from our deposits, and I've got checking accounts and saving accounts, don't, don't get me wrong there. Even though I'm practicing this infinite banking concept, have been for several, several years now, I have checking accounts and saving accounts. And if we're doing, you know, that checking and, and, and saving account um, approach for the convenience of being able to write checks and swipe cards, great. I understand it. But again, the whole, what I'm trying to get us to notice here is the whole amount of what's deposited is at the bank's use. So even if we're using those funds to buy the groceries and get the gas and pay the bill, all these different things that we're doing in life or in business, whatever the case happens to be, the bank has the full use of everything that's been deposited there. That money's not under our control anymore. We're not going to be receiving the compound interest that we otherwise could be earning just by changing one simple thing, just by changing where that is deposited, just by changing where we are depositing our cash flows. Again, we don't own that entity. Compounding could be earned, and it is earned just by the owners. We don't own that, so the owners at the bank are earning that. And that's what's scary is they, they have the full use of that. They say uh, we're owed that amount, but of course, again, we don't have to go too far back in history um, and the, the word bankrupt exists for a reason, is what I'm pointing out here, where, for example, just in the Great Depression, thousands, thousands of banks went bankrupt. So, good luck collecting your money that you had deposited at the bank, right? It's scary. It's scary out there. Could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine? It's wild to think about. It's wild to think about. In some other recording recently, I talked about uh, the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, we're getting close to the holiday season and everything. It's a it's a great Christmas time movie. My family, we enjoy it. I encourage you to watch It's a Wonderful Life. And and you see some of this 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 history being being portrayed about runs on the bank and and banks going bankrupt and just really interesting stuff. But let me go back to this point about money that's deposited in a commercial bank is now no longer ours. The banks owe us that money, of course, but now we are a creditor of the bank and actually an unsecured creditor of the bank. So again, just realizing that the word bankruptcy exists for a reason, and it happens to start with the word bank. Uh, in history, we can see about runs on banks. Again, I know we have these 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 quotes and these and these promises uh, from entities at banks about guaranteeing a, re a return of, of our deposit, you know, what I would like to point out is that the Federal Reserve System is neither federal nor does it have reserves in its system. It's a private entity 
that has been practicing quantitative easing, fractional reserve banking, and that has led to this inflationary environment that we are existing in. Now, let, let me also let me also point out that, okay, because we're talking about becoming your own banker, we're talking about how you can implement the infinite banking concept, how you can be in control of the banking function in your life. Okay, so when you make premium payments to a policy, a properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends, when you pay premiums to an IBC style policy, those premiums are also no longer yours. You've paid for this product, for this entity that you have. Now, legally, technically, legally, that money is the insurance companies. Now, because you own this unilateral contract, you have various guarantees to be able to access capital. But when you're making a policy loan, for example, when you're making a policy loan with a company, you've paid premiums, which is your part of the obligation of this unilateral contract. All of the other obligations are on the insurance company itself, one of which is a guaranteed right to access capital in a known interest environment according to the terms of your policy. So you have the contractual right to access capital, all while, yes, that money is technically and legally no longer yours either. Premiums that have been paid, just like deposits to a bank, those are no longer yours. The difference is you are a part owner of this whole life insurance company where we're not part owners of the banks. We're not we're not profit sharing in the general performance of those banks. And if you want to say something about interest that you're earning at a commercial bank, I'm listening. Just put that number down in the comment section if you'd if you'd like to that you're earning there. And and this isn't all about rate of return, but I'm just saying it is what it is. So you're a part owner with the whole life insurance company, because we're going to practice with mutual life insurance companies. So you do get to participate in the overall performance, the general performance of that company, and that's expressed in a dividend, which is not guaranteed. But again, if you're working with companies that have been paying dividends for a minimum of 100 consecutive years, you have a reasonable expectation, I would say, of anticipating a dividend. And not only that, but that unilateral contract describes your rights of access to compounding cash values. So you get to have uninterrupted compound growth on the premiums that you pay. That contract provides you with guaranteed access to capital. We talk about policy loans mostly here, of course so that we're not interrupting the compounding of premiums that have been paid, and yet we still maintain the right to access capital and use that for whatever it is we want. And then, of course, when you get down to something like the object of terms and conditions and qualifications, like do you it's a contract. It's in the contract that you have the contractual right to access capital. You can, you can call or email, and you're just simply asking for you know, them to send it to X, Y, or Z. So for, from whatever's available, they're going to ask you simply, how much of it do you want sent and where do you want it sent to? That's it. That's it. It's the simplest thing. It's the easiest thing. It's the most beautiful thing, which is so very different from, I know we've talked about um, deposits so far, but let's talk now about, you know, the actual act of borrowing money from these commercial banks. Step number one, do you even qualify? You know, Robert Kiyosaki said one time that banks lend you money when you don't need it. So do you even qualify? And then, of course, they're setting the terms and conditions. They're setting the interest rate. We're the ones who have to front the collateral. They're not sharing 
in their profits and dividends. It's the owners that are receiving that. And then we're paying interest to the tune of 34 and a half cents of every dollar that we earn, according to R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. 34 and a half cents of every dollar is paid in interest alone. That's going to be for our appliances, our cars, our homes, etc. He's got a great breakdown in this in his book that shows these four main areas uh, of of the average spending in America and 34 and a half cents of every dollar paid in interest. How scary is that? Now you think about, I mean, you just think about if, if you had a heart that was minus 34 and a half percent of its power, of its, of its potential power. What if, what if your vehicle was working at that reduced capacity minus 34 and a half you know, percent of its of its capacity, you wouldn't be able to go as far or as fast or haul as much or you're catching on to what I'm saying here. So that is the scary part that we are beholden to the commercial banks, paying them interest on their terms and conditions. And here, you know, I'm going to have some folks that are saying, well, cash is king. You know, I pay cash for everything that I do. Great. I mean, that's a step better for sure. But either way, Everything's financed. Just because you're not paying interest to a commercial bank doesn't mean that you're not losing forever, forever, the opportunity to earn on that cash that you're paying with. So what I'm saying is the banking function exists. Banking exists. Either you pay interest or you forfeit the opportunity to earn interest. Well, there's a better way. You can become your own banker. You can change where deposits go to. You can change who is the owner of the entity, the banking entity that you use in your household, in your business, in your investing. You can change who is receiving profits and dividends from that banking function. You can change who is in control of this entire process. And you and you can grow and scale that over your lifetime to where eventually you can account for 100% of your need of finance in a privatized banking system. Nash in his book talks about building a system of policies over the course of your lifetime to get the snakes and the dragons. He says snakes and dragons. I mean, how, how appropriate to use those, those, those terms. You can get the, the snakes and dragons. And I don't know how long it'll take for you or, or, or someone else. Maybe it'll take seven years. You know, I believe Nash put out the number of, you know, maybe it'll take 20 years for you to get all the snakes and dragons out of your life, for you to be able to get all of your premiums equal to your income, get those numbers the same. But maybe it's more, maybe it's less. less. The point is time's going to go by either way. The financial, the scary financial world that's out there right now, it's probably not going to change. You know, pro government's probably not going to diminish. Taxes uh, very well may not go down and inflation may continue to be around. So, again, if we can begin to control and account for our own private family environment, banking environment for ourselves, why not consider that? Why not consider that? Let me say this one particular point about interest. So when I'm referring to Nash saying that 34 and a half cents of every dollar is paid in interest alone, just let me take just a couple of examples. It'd be an interesting thought just for you to consider your own life. But of course, what the vast majority of folks are doing, I know your particular situation is going to matter the most to you. So here's the question. How many times have you gone in to get a car? It's time for you to, to get another car. And you still had an outstanding balance owed on the car that you currently have. Do you see what I'm saying? If you conventionally financed a vehicle, how often, and it probably wasn't your first vehicle, you're probably not in your last vehicle. So how many cars are being parked by an individual at the car lot where they're going to be getting another car and they're just rolling an outstanding balance into a brand new. See, do you see what I'm saying about perpetual interest being paid to someone else? Those are dollars that are forever 
leaving your household, your hands, your family. All right, second example, homes. The average seems to be somewhere around five years, seven years. Okay, so give or take. But what I'm saying is, is if we either refinance or we move and that mortgage starts all over again every five or seven years or so, that is just more perpetual interest. It's it's financial servitude. It's, oh gracious, it's financial servitude. And then our kids are born into that and then grandkids come into that. So let's, and especially consider those first years, you know, in the very beginning years of, of cars and, and homes, the vast, look this up. You want to see something really scary. Look this up. Look at how much interest you paid last year in car interest and home interest, mortgage interest. Add those numbers up. How much did you pay in interest alone last year? That's a scary thing that I'm asking you to do. And yet, I think it's very helpful to really see where the rubber meets the road. How many dollars have forever left your home because of interest paid to someone else? You know, again, the good the good news here, the good news here is that you can recapture principal from the things that you finance because everything's financed. You can recapture interest. You can capture profits or gains from things that you're financing. Okay. You can become your own banker and do that for yourself. You know, part of what propelled me to talk about this subject in in general today was recently I I got an email from a credit union uh, where I have, I have checking savings accounts. And, you know, there was just this, 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 this title this message in, in in the in the very beginning of the email that's supposed to get your attention about your children, for example. And I talk about children, so I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to judge too harshly there on on the on the on the clickbaitish title. I, I knew that I wanted to read it just to see how they were conveying what it was that I anticipated they were going to convey. And and sure enough, you know, the next thing I know I'm I'm reading about how I need to be getting IRAs on on my children and parking uh, you know parking my money so it can grow and compound and again I'm not making advice here but what I'm pointing out is that while we're told to park our money in these various institutions and locations and products the entities that sell those products are moving money they're not parking money Okay, so let's just walk through this mental exercise. If if my bank or credit union or whoever is saying, well, park your money here, and that could be deposit, save up in a savings account. Okay, now let's put some money in an in a Roth IRA for you. Oh, let's get some of those on the kids and let's get this 503B and just all these all these different things. Okay. Well, let's look at what banks do when they get money. Did you know that? Commercial banks are the largest purchasers of whole life insurance. Now, why is that? It's just a good question. That's all I'm saying. Why is it that we're told to park our money and the banks are just moving and moving and moving money? And one of the things that they move money to, first and foremost, more than anyone else, is whole life insurance. Why is that? And, and the term's called a bank-owned life insurance. I know we got plenty of examples in individuals, the Walt Disney's and the the Pampered Chefs and Warren Buffetts and J.C. Penney's, etc. We've got plenty of examples there. We've got plenty of examples with the banks themselves and what they're doing with money, buying whole life insurance. So I'm just trying to point out. You know, there's that saying of practice what you preach. It's interesting to me that we're told by the conventional gurus to park our money when where we're told to park it, it's not staying parked. It's getting moved around. See, that banking function exists. So my encouragement, of course, to everyone is read R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And then he has got a plethora of of suggested reading that I would encourage you to to continue your reading, How Privatized Banking Really Works, his second book, Building Your Warehouse of Wealth, and so much more, so much more. 
educate yourself on the concept of the banking function. Learn that you can control that function for yourself in your household, in your business, in your investing. Dive in on this channel. Ask questions. You can comment in the comments. You can email. You can line up a strategy phone call where I will talk with you one-on-one -on -one about your particular situation and what it could look like for you to implement this infinite banking concept into your household or your business or your investing. And my overall belief, and this is why this is why I'm on here on this podcast, on this YouTube channel, everything that we do with video and audio content, because like Nash said, when you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. So I'm just doing my best to put my best practices out there, speed up your learning curve that I've gone through over the past going on eight years now and reading Nash's book and then implementing this process and buying these types of policies just as a consumer myself. And now for the past few years, coaching other people on how to become financially independent and autonomous in what it is that they're doing in life. So this has been a great pleasure for me to talk about the things that are that are scary out there in the financial world. And I hope, I hope that what it has done has shed light where where light can be shed on a better way where you can become your own banker. And as you are vetting this infinite banking concept and you're learning about this and it comes time to where you're you're ready to talk to somebody you know my encouragement there is of course i put out as much information as i can here for free just open access because i believe that when you know what's going on you'll know what to do and if i've been the one that's been sharing the nuts and bolts on how to implement this concept and how to understand this concept that you'll hopefully you'll you'll want to do that with me but regardless, as you're vetting this concept and you're talking with somebody, you know, just ask that, you know, my, my request is that you just ask that person, if it's not me, I wish you the best, ask that person if they personally practice the infinite banking concept as described in R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Because if you're going to a box store, if you're going to so-and-so that you know are there in your family uh, who has an insurance license, to help you get a policy like what you hear me describe here, if they're not personally practicing this concept, they can't help you. They'll be more than happy to sell you a product. And I'm all about having open, easy access to lots of pro products and services in this in as as close to a you know capitalist economy as we can have. But if they're not personally practicing this concept, they can't help you. So that's where I would start. When I was speaking to a professional individual in any space, I want to know, well, what do you have? What are you doing? Can you show me policies that you personally own and how you've implemented this infinite banking concept with those policies? So I'm just saying I'm open to having that conversation. I'm open to talking about those things, and I, I look forward to those conversations. But know what your professional practices themselves. That's that's my encouragement there. So if you'd like to have that personalized strategy call, you can reach us at 828-817-4223, or you can email durhamtalents at gmail.com. This has been a great pleasure for me. I do look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day. Take care. Is debt haunting you? Is inflation ghosting your chances at retirement? Do you find the market a nightmare out there? Dad jokes for days. Mean it, mean it, mean it, mean it, mean Yeah, there's something strange in the neighborhood. Who are you going to call? Bank busters. Bank busters. That's a good one. <clears throat> Bank busters. Ooh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bank busters. Me, me.